thank you for joining us uh, for another episode of Condo Insider. I'm your host today. My name is Jane Sugimura, and Condo Insider is the weekly show about condo living and, uh, and uh, how it affects people who live and work in condos. And uh, today I have as my guest uh, a good friend, uh, John Morris. He's an attorney and a partner with Ekimoto and Morris. And he's had uh, his firm, you know, specializes in condo association law. And we're going to be discussing non-judicial foreclosure. What's the beef? We had a bill, Senate Bill 551, this session, and it was very, very controversial. And and being and having attended the hearings, I kind of think that some of the people who were there, and even some of the people who you know were following the bill didn't quite understand it. And so hopefully, uh, and, and since it's now a law, uh, we, we, I, I, I've asked John to come and help, help us understand it. First of all, thank you for joining us, John. Yes, thanks for inviting me. And uh, why don't you tell us about your firm? Tell, tell the listeners about what you do. Uh, uh, we represent mainly condominiums, uh, some homeowner associations. We do um, general advice, plus we also do collections and enforcement of the rules. So that's basically our practice. Okay, and we're here to talk about basically, there was a bill this session, Senate Bill 551, that caused a, a whole lot of up, up, uproar. You know, we had, you know, very uh, challenging testimony on both sides on yeah. this bill. So why don't you tell us what it was all about, Senate Bill 551? Well, it. It was in response to a, um, several appellate decisions in Hawaii, plus there was a district court, federal district court, which from our point of view essentially rewrote history because they said the legislature had not intended to allow condominium associations to conduct non-judicial foreclosures unless they had some kind of an agreement with the owners or unless the authority to conduct non-judicial foreclosures was written specifically into their governing documents. Couldn't be just a general statement of the right to foreclose. It had to say non-judicial power of sale foreclosures. So we as an industry, as, as attorneys representing, were very surprised to see these decisions because back in 1999, when we first got the right to conduct non-judicial foreclosures, there was no question in our mind that the legislature did intend to allow us to use the non-judicial process. Why don't you tell the audience, what's the difference, what is a non-judicial foreclosure? Well, it's in some ways it's like a do-it-yourself foreclosure. You do not actually have to file paperwork in court, um, but you do have to follow a specific procedure. When the law, the, the recent law, which has been in effect for six or seven years, it requires you to notify the owner that you're intending to conduct a non-judicial, then you have to give them 60 days to do something if they are going to try and pay off. They have a right to propose a payment plan of up to 12 months, but it's, it's a foreclosure in which the association, usually through its attorney, can notify the owner of their delinquency, notify the owner the association intends to foreclose, give the owner notice and hold a sale, put an advertisement in the paper, advertise the property for sale and sell the property. In contrast, in a judicial foreclosure, you have to file a complaint in court, um, move for summary judgment, which is judgment simply saying that you are owed money, you're entitled to sell the property, um, have the court authorize you to proceed and have the court appoint a commissioner to sell the property. The commissioner, as in a non-judicial, advertises the property, holds an auction, and sells the property. So the process is essentially the same, except in a non-judicial, the association does not have to go through the court process, but they do have to follow very specific procedures written into the law as why, to how Why would an association have to do foreclosure to begin with? Well, the problem is if someone is not paying, at some point the association has to take action to get paid. They don't have a lot of alternatives, and probably the most effective alternative is telling the owner, if you cannot afford to stay in this association, we will have to foreclose on you. 
sell the unit to someone who can afford to pay their maintenance fees because the problem is if you don't pay, it means all of your fellow owners have to make up the difference. So it can be very difficult for a board to allow an owner to stay in a condominium or a homeowner association if they're not paying because the and, others and, you know, have let's, to pay. To, to explain to some of our owners who may not understand, with yeah. a condominium, why, they, as a, a person who owns a unit in an association, a yes. condominium association, you are required under the governing documents which you know basically say what you're supposed to do and what you mm -hmm. what you can and cannot do. That you have to pay maintenance fees, and yeah. the maintenance fees are used to operate the building. Right? Yes. They pay for the electricity, the yes. employees, the insurance. They pay for everything that's necessary for the association to operate this building. And so basically, if you if people don't pay their maintenance fees, I mean it's it's feasible that you might have to lay off your staff because you don't have money to pay them. Yes. Uh, you might have to downsize on your services and tell people, well, you're going to have to stop using so much electricity or water because yeah. we can't pay the bill. Yes, that is the main problem because it's, everyone is in the same organization, namely the association together, and if they don't all pay their fair share to keep the building operating, the other owners have to make up the difference, and if too many owners go delinquent, then there aren't enough other owners to make up the difference. The maintenance fee sometimes has to go up just to cover the losses. So that is the basic problem. Without every owner paying their fair share, the other owners have to make up the, the difference. And, and, if, and to, to, to give you an example, I think we, just before the show, I was telling you about you know, during the eight, uh, two, in the 2008 period, there were the, all these foreclosures during the recession. There was somebody in Kihei who called me and said that their, their building was like 80% investor owned and 20% yeah. owner occupant. Over 50% were, you know, had, had, were, had abandoned their units and so they were on the brink of bankruptcy. That's, that's what happens, right? When you have people who don't, who don't or cannot pay their maintenance fees, your cash flow doesn't come in and the building can't operate. That's pretty much what happens and it, it's like a downward spiral because People who are paying have to make up the difference. The maintenance fee goes up, and that tends to make it much more difficult for the association to operate because they have to start cutting back. And, and, and maybe not to get off the subject, but that would be a reason why a person who is concerned about paying maintenance fees, when they go in to buy, look at a condo, they would want to know what the owner-occupant ratio is because if you have a whole lot of investor owners and the, uh, and the economy decides to go south, Yes. then there might be a lot of people defaulting. And if you're an owner-occupant, you're going to be left holding the bag yes, and maybe subsidizing all sure. those people who don't pay their maintenance fees. And that's why a lot of lenders look at the same statistic because they're worried that if a building has too many investors, they are very not heavily invested in the project and they're more likely to walk away if they feel like they're losing money than someone who actually lives in the project. Okay, and so, you know, so... When you, when, when, and you advise condo associations on collections. Mm -hmm. So when would an association decide whether to use, you know, a, a, use a judicial foreclosure or a non-judicial foreclosure? Because they have a choice, right? Yes, they do have a choice. And the problem for associations is that um, the judicial process usually takes two to three times as long and costs two to three times as much to get the same fairly crummy result, which is a function of the fact that Hawaii's foreclosure law gives priority to the first lien on the property, which is almost always a mortgage. So the association board is faced with the proposition of spending 10, 12 or more thousand dollars and taking a year and a half to complete the foreclosure or spending maybe four, five, six thousand dollars and taking six months to complete the process. And part of that problem is that when there are foreclosures, there are usually a lot of foreclosures, they clog the courts, it takes the courts longer to schedule. And the problem is the way the association operates, it is often trying to foreclose on a property that is worth that is essentially worthless. And the reason is because if there is a mortgage on the property, that will always take priority. And that will be any sale the association makes has to be made subject to that mortgage. 
And you know, when you do these non-judicial foreclosures, and, and I, you know, uh, being president of a, of a condominium association who has done non-judicial foreclosures, the reason why we've done it is basically to get the unit back, because usually we're the ones who bug uh, at the auction, yes. uh, you know, are the ones who are uh, uh, bidding on it. And we take it back, the unit, and we rent it, and we use it to basically pay back the delinquency yes. and to uh, provide to cash flow sure. to the association so that they get paid maintenance fees for that unit that wasn't paying before. Yes, that's pretty much what most associations, because the problem is if you um, are going to start a foreclosure, you get the title report, you look in the title report, the unit's worth 400000 but it has a mortgage of 500000 you know that when you hold your foreclosure auction, you will have to sell that $400,000 unit subject to the $500,000 mortgage, which means anyone who buys that unit will buy it with the mortgage still on the property. And unfortunately, the holder of that mortgage can then come and foreclose on their mortgage and wipe out the buyer's interest. So that applies to associations, that applies to anyone else who buys from association. They can lose all of their interest and they cannot do anything that affects a mortgage that was recorded prior to the association's lien. So that's the problem facing most boards. They are trying to foreclose on a property to sell it at auction when it is actually has a minus value. It has a mortgage on it which will stay on the property and the association will have to sell it subject to that mortgage. So someone who buys it will know that at some point that mortgage can also be foreclosed and it will wipe out the association's interest or the interest of anyone who buys in an association auction. And, you know, when you sell a subject to the mortgage, I mean, the people who come to the auction, and there, there is a public yeah. auction where you actually have a sale yes. and there are people who are interested who will show up because they've seen the newspaper ads yes. that give the date and time of the auction. And so they come thinking they're going to pick up something yes. cheap, right? Yes. And so they're told you buy subject to mortgage and they're given written notice on a fact sheet that it's you're, you're they're buying it subject to a mortgage and the name of the lender is on the notice we try to do that because if we don't do that there are people you can say it you can try and explain to them but they will they will bid and sometimes buy the property and then they'll find out that they bought it subject to a mortgage that is more than it's worth and that mortgage is still on the property. So you're right. We always try and fully disclose that the association's auction in almost every case is subject to a prior mortgage which will remain on the property after the association's and so auction. So let's just give an example. Let's say the association lien is three thousand yeah. dollars. And so they have a lien by statute. Yes. And then you do the non judicial foreclosure, so the auction is held to foreclose that three thousand dollar lien. Yeah. And so typically the association will bid its judgment. They don't have to actually put $3,000 on the table. No, they credit bid. They, they, yeah. they credit bid. So they can bid $3,000. So let's say I show up at the auction. If I want that, I have to bid higher than the $3,000. And so if I bid $4,000, if, if the association wants to give it to me, I have to write you a check for $4,000. It goes to the association, yes. right? And I get this property. But let's say the very next day, First Hawaiian Bank is the lender and they decide to hold a foreclosure, I lose that. I never yeah. get my $4,000 back, right? No, because you bought that. When you bought it, all you got were our rights as an association, and our rights as an association are subject to the lender's rights because their mortgage is the first lien on the property. So that's one of the problems we often had. People would say, how can the association buy it for a dollar? And we would say, because nobody wanted it because it was worth $100,000 less than the mortgage that would remain on the property after we sold it. So, and nobody knows when that lender is going to come forward no, and foreclose. Would, that was pretty common. We would, we would push forward with the foreclosure because the board felt compelled to do so out of fairness to the owners who were paying. We would hold an auction and sometimes within just a few months, the lender would come along behind. They would foreclose. They would wipe out our interest. Or they would wipe out the interest of anyone who bought from us. And that would be the end of that. The lender would then take the property back and that person or the association would lose their interest in the property because the mortgage would wipe out 
all the liens and claims on that property that were recorded after the mortgage. Okay, well, why don't we take a break now? Because now that we've kind of explained it, let's, when we come back, we'll talk about the, uh, the court decisions yes. and how that affects okay. us. Okay. Okay, we're going to take a one minute break. え、ティンクテックハワイが日本語でお送りしています。こんにちは、ハワイ。ポストのクニセイカリです。え、毎週各週月曜日、え、2時からですね、日本語で日本語で活躍されていらっしゃるハワイのいろいろな方をお招きして
Excuse me, I can remember being there. I think I was there, and I think I remember seeing yes, this committee report. Yes, that was report. a surprise. And, yeah. and, and it was. It, it, the, the facts at that time was because that we were going through a recession, it was taking us so long for associations to get through a judicial foreclosure. It took us six to eight months even to get a motion for summary judgment. Yes, it took us another very... six to eight months to get a motion to confirm. We were in court for a year and a half to two years if we were lucky because yes. there were all these cases that were jamming up the foreclosure court. There was only one foreclosure judge yes, who was, was handling it. everything. And, was and we went to the legislature and, and there were a whole lot of other issues, but this was their fallback position. And yeah. it was very clear to me Yes. being there and being a witness to the events, so yes. to speak, no, no. That, 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 that they intended us to have the right to do non-judicial foreclosure. Yes, that was it. And we explained to them, we said we're losing money because of the problem of the lender always being in first position, because of the problem the unit dropped in value below the amount of the mortgage, making it essentially worthless. That was one of the options they gave us. And the other problem, of course, was even if the lender was foreclosing, it was taking them a year and a half to complete their foreclosure. And during that time, associations would usually be getting nothing. Right. Because there would be no one paying. And that meant that the other owners who um, were yeah. complying with the law and making their monthly payments, they ended up subsidizing the people who didn't pay. Yes. And so that was the shock to almost everyone when the Intermediate Court of Appeals ruled that based on their view of the legislative history, there was no intention to allow associations to do non-judicials unless they had specific authority, which in fact they did have because of the way the condominium law worked. That was deemed to be part of their bylaws as a matter of law. But that was a big shock, and that's what led to SB 551, which is now to Act 282. We went back to the legislature and said, we must be missing something. When we asked you to do this 19 years ago, you were very clear that you were helping us out. And in fact, in 2012, we even went to the legislature and said, we would like our own foreclosure law. We don't want to have the terms mortgage and all the rest of the stuff. We want a section in the foreclosure law purely for associations, which they did. They passed a section which applies only to condominiums and HOAs. So we couldn't understand how the Intermediate Court of Appeals could reach a conclusion that the legislature did not intend to give us the right to do a non-judicial without some extra, because we'd actually got this completely separate section of the foreclosure law just for us. But they said, no, that doesn't count. You have to have, they said, it's just like a mortgage. You have to have some written agreement saying you can do a non-judicial. And that's what led us to go back to the legislature and say, we need your help because this is clearly not what you intended. And in fact, as 551 shows, they agreed with us. This and, is and, not and what we intended. And 551 basically says, we really, really meant yes, it. That's... But back in you know, 1999, when we passed yes. those, 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 because uh, the, the, the bill sets, I mean, the bill sets out this legislative yes. history. And it says this was... And it talks about the committee reports, and, and so yes. it kind of regurgitates everything that we were all aware of this whole 19-year period. It's yes. only the ICA, for some reason, who yes. didn't seem to understand uh, and, and the, this uh, legislative history that all of us were part of. We, we participated in it, and so we, we couldn't understand the Sokol decision no. when it came out. And so, and, and so in, in fact, I think one of the legislators, when we went to ask them to do... Uh, the predecessor, you know, when we were talking about what mm -hmm. became Senate Bill 551, it's like, well, why do you need this? It's like, because there's this court that says there's no legislative history, and there's plenty of legislative yes, history. We so we need for it. you to come and do a bill that says, yes, there's legislative, and we really meant it. Yeah. And, you know, so this is setting them, and, and, it's, and this is not unusual because legislatures, I mean, they don't do it all the time, but uh, and when there has unknown, been yeah. uh, a miscarriage of justice, the legislature can tell the judiciary, hey guys, you got it wrong. Yes, and that's what this... And that's what the Senate Bill 551 is all yeah. about. The first section actually goes into some detail about what they did intend over the last 20 years. And so that's very helpful to us. There are other provisions, but that, as you say, confirms that we did really mean to allow associations to do non-judicials without any additional agreements or anything else. It was our attempt to help them out.
And in fact, the, the legislation in, in the prior acts, it did say that because we indicate we've decided that you know condominiums can can do yeah. uh, non-judicial foreclosures, it's de it's deemed to be in their bylaws. Yes. That language is in the statute. That's what the statute said. Yeah, it said <laughs> so, this is deemed by operation of law this right to do non-judicials to be put into every set of bylaws in the state. And and you know so that, that's why you know since the the words are in the legislature the legislation. It's like, how come the ICA couldn't see that? Yes, it was a surprise. Many people were very surprised when that decision came out. But because of those decisions, there have been impacts on the associations, right? These insurance, tell, tell, tell audience about the insurance issues yes. regarding the Sakal decision and Malabi decisions. So, the, so the, now it's pretty clear, almost every insurance company is excluding coverage for claims against an association or wrongful non-judicial foreclosure. Many additional, even after this act was passed and, and allowed to become law, there, are, there have been many additional lawsuits filed alleging that the associations engaged, particular associations engaged in wrongful foreclosure. So that is happening after this. So it's making difficult, it's difficult for associations. They have to disclose that there are claims being made against them. Their insurance coverage has been limited because of the numerous claims being filed against them. So it has had an impact, and that's why we are grateful that the association took the time to pass this bill. Okay, and, and as you indicated, the, bill has, bill, the, the Senate bill has become law. It's yes. Act 282, yes. and it became law without the governor's signature, but it is law nevertheless. Yes, the governor, I think, weighed everything, and he did decide. He thought there were problems, but he did decide to let it become law. And, and, and now with the passage of Senate Bill uh, uh, 551, do you think that things will change? I mean, will, will associations feel more comfortable using non-judicial foreclosure now that this uh, they, bill has passed? They should do, but the problem is the Intermediate Court of Appeals, the two decisions, uh, Sakal and Malabe, are both being appealed to the Hawaii Supreme Court. And so there is still a lot of uncertainty about what the court might rule when it um, decides those two cases. But Sakal is coming up for oral arguments soon, right? No, I believe it's actually Malabe. Oh, Malabe. Okay. Yes. Sakal, um, the court did not agree to um, review the decision at the association's request. They are reviewing it from the homeowner's request. In Malabe, the court has said we will um, review the association's appeal and determine whether this bill and this um, non-judicial foreclosure practice of the last 20 years was consistent with the law. So now, because both of those decisions are on appeal, the, there is still a certain, or there is still uncertainty about how the court may rule the Hawaii Supreme Court on both of these appeals. And that has, to that extent, held people back from relying on SB 551 Act 282, which, according to its terms, should be completely, um, should allow association to continue to conduct non judicial foreclosures. But there is a concern the courts may um, rule in such a way that that could become an issue in the future. Okay, but we should be uh, learning pretty soon what's going to happen. Well, the, the, I think the oral argument in Malabe is in about a, um, a month, maybe six weeks, and then it's just a question of when the court um, issues its decision. And we'll probably have another show once we yes, find those Yes, that'll results. be the um, determining thing, because how the court responds to Act 282, SB 551, will be the determining factor in both of those cases. I okay, think. then we have to look forward to that, those decisions, yes, and you'll have indeed. to come back when that happens. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for joining us. And like I said, you know, when, when, we, when we, we'll do another update on this issue, when the Supreme Court uh, makes a decision, because it does impact everybody who lives and works in condominiums. Thank you for uh, joining us today. And please join us next week for another uh, uh, interesting uh, episode of Condo Insider. Thank you and mahalo.